Real? Oh, it yeah. is, it is. <laughs> Don't get on him. He did a good job. In front of his pictures in the paper. His picture? Mm -hmm. Did you get arrested again? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, shows him just a running. Mm -hmm. From the law, probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Unavoidable. 
barn, barn tractor or something like that. The time got set wrong on my alarm clock, the actual time. Because I was late for this, and then I was late for a doctor's appointment, or almost late. And it's like, there's something going on. I'm never late like this. And then it's, oh, no, I know. Yep. I don't know how it happened. I assume I did it. Nobody else ever blamed. Oh, uh, yeah, well. Cats, and they don't mess with the alarm. Yeah. A oh, bad battery or bad electricity. See, you know. It could be. Yeah. I bet that that was it. Yeah. We'll just go with that. That's <laughs> that my fault. <laughs> <laughs> That's better than saying I forgot to or I did something. I think it happened like I was trying to change the um, alarm time and I think I hit the wrong one and didn't realize it. It was a whole hour off. Wow. <laughs> Makes a difference, yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Because I got up that morning and plenty of time, I thought, going by the alarm clock, it was like plenty of time. I go out and eat coffee, and I'm sitting there, and I'm reading, and, and all of a sudden, it's like, oh, it's time to go. <laughs> Did I knock out or something? Now, later in the week, it happened again, and I finally decided I better check this out. That's what it was. Say, did you just get up? I walk in my Of course, hey, is it that obvious? <laughs> yeah, it looks yeah. Like <laughs> and I said, well, I did the on and I didn't know this was that dark. I guess someone must have turned it off. Someone probably did. Probably you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, unfortunately. My husband used to like to me to get smooth, and I get so tired of it. I'd rather just get up. Sit down. You know. Yeah. Be tortured by it. Good morning. Yeah. Well, good morning. I'm sorry. Thank you for that. I'm sorry. You are not alone. Good to have you all here this morning. Good to see the sun shining out there. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. Uh, remind you again of over there and, and uh, treats and water and chocolate milk and orange juice and hot chocolate or anything else that your heart desires you can make over there. Just mix them all together. You know, who knows? Punch, right? So, uh, but I hope that you've had a good week and that uh, you're in good health and you're doing well. Amen. Tomorrow night is uh, our trunk and treat adventure. And uh, so a number of folks will be back here in the back parking lot with their trunks open and their trunks decorated. And uh, we'll have a bunch of kids come through. They wait in line for us to get set up. They're, they know we're here. So <laughs> they, they wait in line. They, I can take 25 steps and get like 15 houses. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, in one, in one little swoop. So, um, but we're looking forward to that. If you've never experienced that, Feel free to come out and join us tomorrow. Turn off all the lights in your house. All right, so when they come by your house, they go, oh, these people aren't home. And uh, join us here. We'll have a good time together. Youth do that every year. They've done it for the last four years. And uh, uh, our most consistent members are Rita and Mary Lane. They just, every year, they make up their carts and I think Mary Lane had one of those ball hats on that's pointed in the top. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I got one, and my kids told me I couldn't wear it. I did. <laughs> uh, but uh, we'll have a good time. We hope that you can join us. Well, uh, if you're joining us online for the first time, uh, we're going through a, a study on how do I start my walk with Jesus. 
And uh, we've, we've been at this for, this is our fourth week, or fifth week uh, today, and uh, we've got four more to go. I said eight weeks originally, but I forgot that October had five weeks in it, so we get a, we give the preacher an extra week. He probably won't have anything to say during that last week, but <laughs> you know how preachers are. Uh, but uh, we've, we've tried to go through this booklet, and if you're watching us online, you don't have a copy of the booklet, let me know. I'd be happy to give you a copy. Contact the church office or send me an email or a text, and I'd be happy to put one in your hands. Uh, we've shipped them all over the world, so uh, it would be no problem to get one to you. But we've come down so far, uh, the first lesson was on assurance, and the reason that we went through assurance is because that's the first place the devil is going to attack anybody when they are uh, begin to walk with Christ, is to say, are you sure you did everything right? Are you sure, Do you are you positive that you're saved? How could you do that? How could you think that? How could you look at that? How could you think that? And still be a Christian. So one of the first things that's important in the walk of Christ is to realize not what you feel, but what the Bible says is truth about assurance. And uh, the Bible is filled with verses, and it's in our handbook. We went over that. We won't retrace that. But that's one of the first parts, and one of the big victories that you need to get in your life is the assurance of my salvation. I've been saved for a lot of years. And uh, I tell you, but I don't want you to think I'm that old. And uh, for a lot of years, and I still, every once in a while, that other voice is in the back of my head that'll say, how could you be like that? And uh, and I, I have to go right to the front of my Bible, open it up and say, remember the exercise I gave you, right in the front leaf of your Bible, this is the date that I made that decision for Jesus, say, I was there when it happened, and I ought to know. So assurance. The second one is, after we uh, uh, acknowledge Christ as our personal Savior, then one of the things that we need to do is follow the Lord and believe his baptism. We went through that uh, so that we were uh, understanding that. I always think of that as the first step in obedience. So like when I was young, um, you know, I got saved about five or six times. I didn't really, but I mean, I, I went forward and someone dealt with me and, and uh, I felt real rosy and, and great and then... Uh, I didn't for a while, and then I did again, and then I didn't for a while, and then I did again. I, I was got baptized so many times I started wrinkling, uh, you know, because I'd been in the water too much. And uh, but there was a time in my life, uh, in my teens, when I I realized I was a sinner, and that that, that was trouble, and that I I ne I needed help, and my help I knew came from the Lord. And at that time in my life, what I did is I committed my heart and my life to Jesus Christ. And that time, I really knew what I did. I mean, it was intentional. It was on purpose. It wasn't because someone told a sad story at the end of a sermon, and I, I wanted one of those Maytag washing machines so bad, I just had to come forward. I, okay, I wasn't one of those things. It was actually the truth of God working in my heart. And I surrendered my heart to the Lord. And after that, I wanted to find out what's the first thing that I needed to do, and one of the first things, the act of obedience is baptism. And why is that so important? What What is the hardest thing to do after you acknowledge Christ your Savior? What's the hardest thing to do? That's to tell other people. Tell other people. And so uh, believer's baptism gives us the opportunity, because it's really all that it is is an outward testimony of what's happened within. And that's one of the, the first steps is to make a public stand. Now, um, some folks have a real hard time standing in front of somebody else, and other folks, they don't have any problem with it at all. Some folks, we wish they would stand more often, and some that are standing, we wish they wouldn't. But uh, some people have a real hard time of, of being public about anything in their life. As a Christian, one of the things that you need to do is be public about your uh, life with Christ. Now, what's the devil tell you? The devil say, nobody wants to know. What's the devil tell you? They'll make fun of you. What's the devil tell you? A bunch of things. Because he doesn't want you to make a public testimony. All right? But if you do it, and you don't have to be bombastic. You don't have to be a bull in a china closet. Some of us come by that naturally, but you don't have to be that way. 
by just taking a stand and saying, I don't do that, I'm sorry, or I'd rather do this, or I go to church on Sunday, you want to go with me? I mean, a lot of those are very easy ways to be able to be a testimony. So one of the reasons for believer's baptism, besides the fact that the Bible commands it, is we do it because it's one of the first steps of being public about our faith. Uh, I remember one of the first times after I got baptized, and that was kind of scary for me, and that was in a church where people knew and loved me. I still was scared. Uh, then you take it outside the church where people don't really know you. And I think, well, how in the world am I going to take a stand? And what I did one day is I decided I was going to take my Bible to work. And that's when I wish I was the Incredible Hulk and I had a big enough bicep. <laughs> I could somehow or another get that Bible tucked up underneath. Maybe if I could have the little New Testament. Let me see if I can do that. That would probably work out just right. Amen. I should have taken something like this. Do you still see it, John? See, today, I, that's what I should have done. But I, I was, I was going to make a statement. I took my Bible to work, and it felt like a Samsonite over ba a size bag suitcase. By the time I got to the office, I felt like I was going like this. And if, if I didn't feel that way, when I looked in the faces of everybody in that office, I would have, because they all went, you know, they looked right down at that book, and it was like, it was neon. But I remember taking that in the office, and uh, I sat down on the edge of my desk, you know, like this. And uh, everybody in that office, all 35 guys in that office, they're all Marines. And uh, they're, all those guys in that office, they were like, like this. But it was an opportunity for me to testify. When I sat in my seat, I'm telling the truth, I did not even feel my legs from the waist down. I was so absolutely nervous. And I had that on the edge of my desk. And people would walk by my desk and they'd go, <laughs> you know, like this. I just, it was, I thought, how can a book, just a book, draw that much attention? And so one of the reasons for baptism, believer's baptism, is to begin that life of testifying of what God's done. All right? So, uh, the third thing, if I'm going to walk with Christ, is church membership. Now, a lot of people stumble over church membership. And I'll give you a couple, of, well, why don't you give me a couple of reasons. Why do you think people stumble over church membership? If I have a thought or an idea, what does it signify? You really don't know where you want to go and you have to go and find an area that that you feel comfortable but yep. you don't know where to go in the beginning okay that's a good reason right there just where do i where, you where do i join <laughs> that i'm not going to say oops what did i do that for okay but what what does what is joining a church different than going to a church and not joining a church what do you feel like is you do what level is is joining versus just going it's more of a commitment commitment there you go yeah one of the reasons people don't want to join a church is there's a commitment all right and people shy away from commitments as a military the one thing we found out for sure always raise your hand but just not real high okay <laughs> you want other people's hands to be higher than yours you know but don't don't raise your hand, you'll get in trouble. But if you raise your hand, it's like three quarters of the way up. <laughs> Plug your ears, you're not supposed to know this. Uh, three quarters of the way up. Uh, then other people's hands will be higher and they'll call on them, see? Uh, commitment. We, we have a problem with commitment. So one of the reasons that people push back against church membership is commitment. Another reason people push back against church commitment, uh, Christians that have been saved for a while, why, why would you think? Uh, older Christians push back against church membership. What's happened in their past? They've been hurt. They've been hurt. Mm -hmm. They've been hurt. And they go, I'm not doing that again. Mm -hmm. All right. I'll go and make a no commitment. I know I need to go. I know I want to go. But if it, the first time something happens like happened before, I'm out of here. All right. Like, you can't do that if you're a member. You can only do that if you're a non-member. <laughs> but you can do that whether you're a member or not. But, I mean, it, that is, that is how the devil is so slick at getting us. I, I say when 
I accepted Christ my Savior, and I realized it had nothing to do with me. It had everything to do with him. That's assurance. Okay? I followed the Lord and believer in baptism because it was the first thing I could do. That, at the time, seemed hard, but it was really easier than most of the other things to do. I was not in a hostile area. I was in a church. They were all waiting for me to happen. So it was kind of, they were very receptive. <coughs> and then the next one is making a commitment, saying, I'm putting my tent pegs down the ground here. I want to live my life out in my community as a public testimony to the world around me. That's what a local church does. Uh, so you work uh, as a teacher. teacher. All right. You're involved in conversations with other teachers at, from time to time. Do they ever ask you the question, where do you go? We actually, we've talked about it a lot. Okay. So like, since it's a smaller school, we all kind of know where each other goes. Goes to church. Yeah, okay. which is nice. So, so if someone says to you, I go to the Catholic church, what in your mind do you think? what you know about Catholicism, right? Mm -hmm. If someone says, I go to the Methodist church, you think, oh, they're right across the street. No, I mean, you think, uh, you, think you, you have in your mind this thing of what a Methodist is, or a Presbyterian, or a Baptist. <coughs> How many of you have ever said, oh, I go to the Baptist church, and oh, you're one of those. See? They, and we all tend to categorize people based yeah. upon where you go to church of what we think we know about that. But I would just say this, whether someone's right in their assessment or wrong, one of the purposes of being involved in the local church is that you have a further testimony that you go. About every place I go, people ask me where I go to church. And it's because in business, I always ask that question. You've heard me say it before. Every appointment I have, I say, um, I want to just let you know I'm faith-based. I don't know what that means to you, but what it means is I'm not going to lie to you because I have to give an answer to someone that's greater than you and I, and I want to do it with joy and not with fear. And uh, I've only had two responses to that. One is, oh, like they don't have a clue what I just said. And the other one is, oh, really, what church do you go to? I mean, it's just that, that quick they say, oh, really? And so I know whether I'm dealing with someone that has some semblance of faith or not just by that question or that statement that I made. And so, But it gives you an opportunity to say, uh, uh, church membership is an outward testimony. But not only that, it gives you the opportunity to connect with what God's plans are for a Christian. And that's what we went over last week uh, on pages uh, 20, um, uh, actually 18 through 22. Uh, we spent time about the founder of the church on page 20. We talked about why we should attend. And the basic uh, 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 purpose of attending was faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word, word, word of God. And so what happens in church should involve, among many other things, the communication of God's word. So obviously, the, when we think of communicating God's word, what's the first thing that comes to our mind when we come to church? Preaching, right? Mm -hmm. The second one maybe would be teaching, or it could flip-flop. It could be teaching and preaching. But what's another way that we exchange God's word? Singing. Singing, all right? That's the reason the hymns and the, the uh, choruses that we sing are, are just filled with biblical truth is because we sing it. What's the easiest way to communicate the gospel story to young kids? Music, yeah, music. Sing them, sing them. You know, I stop and let me tell you what the Lord has. I mean, I'm, I, I probably was six years old the first time I heard that. Maybe earlier, I don't know. But I've never forgot that. All right, read your Bible, pray every day. But there's a first part of that. Do you remember that one is? Neglect your Bible, forget to pray, and you shrink, 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 and you shrink, 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 and you shrink, shrink, shrink. Neglect your Bible and forget to pray, and you shrink, shrink, shrink. And then it goes the reverse. Read your Bible, pray every day, and you grow, grow, grow. And I, I remember those to this day. So that, that one of the ways to communicate the word is through singing. As we get older. <coughs> They, they become more doctrinally packed. One of the things, in most of modern human history, people could not read. They got their doctrine from the hymns, yep. not from reading their Bible. That, mm -hmm. that came, reading the Bible has really only, for most of the population, been in the last 100, 150 years. 
He didn't know how to, to read, so you, know, you, you would teach him through the song. Right. What a wonderful way to do that. So one of the ways to communicate that is through singing. What's another way to communicate that? Fellowship. Fellowship, okay? How are you doing? Oh, I've had a bad week. Oh, really? What happened? Oh, I'm telling you. Everything's happened. Oh, really? Well, tell me some more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'll tell you what. That reminds me of this great verse. And then you share the verse. That's the communication of God's word. And so one of the reasons that we go to church is because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When I come to church, I may be depressed and down in the dumps just because of the circumstances of life. And I come to church, I interact with people that have this smile on their face and a warm hug or a warm handshake. Uh, I hear the singing, I hear the preaching, and afterwards I feel like I could charge hell with a squirt gun. I mean, I'm so uh, filled with power and strength. That's, that's the local church. And so why is it that we have such a struggle at some point in our life or at different times in our life? Why is it that we have such a struggle getting to church? Our moms don't want us to go? This is the first thing that came to my mind. Um, our neighbors don't want us to go. Uh, God doesn't want us to go. The devil. The devil. <laughs> All right. So he doesn't want us to go. I mean, isn't it amazing? And we've talked about this before, how, you know, at 7.30 to 9, Sunday morning, we can have the worst sore throat in the world. But at 10 <laughs> o'clock, yeah, all of a sudden it got well. I mean, it's just the devil is just so ever-present. And that's the reason we have to realize anytime someone starts attacking you somewhere, it's probably because it's a pretty important place. All right. And so assurance, labor, baptism, church membership. All right. So on page number 22, where we left off of last week, uh, number six, in Ephesians, we learned that there were different people that God gave to the church to minister to the church. And what were those uh, positions? Apostles, prophets, prophets, pastors, and teachers. And teachers, okay. So, uh, apostles, uh, there were apostles of the Lamb, meaning the Lamb being Jesus Christ, and they died off. There were apostles after the Lamb, Paul being one, he said he was born out of due time, an apostle. And their, when their ministry stopped, when the Bible was complete, because the ministry of an apostle was to tell God's word, and when God's word was complete, and we call it in canon, or a Bible complete, then there was no need for an apostle, okay? Apostles and prophets, both of them had similar... Uh, responsibilities is is the word was not known and so they spoke the word a lot of the old testament a uh, good portion of that is prophetical books that prophesy about the future when we have a completed bible we no longer have that an evangelist was a specific individual within a church and i think i mentioned last week um, every once in a while we we kind of assign these titles to people who are doing something uh, to make that sound like it's official but an evangelist in the Bible was not someone that traveled around to different churches and preached, okay? Uh, and that was a missionary. An evangelist in the Bible was someone within a local congregation that had the ministry and the gift of telling other people about Jesus Christ. And you say, well, I don't feel like I have that gift. Well, you might not have ever looked, okay? Uh, the gifts uh, sometimes have to be uh, found like gold. Uh, they have to be mined, and then after they're mined, then they have to uh, be identified as specifically what they are, and then they have to be put to practice. You'd be surprised, in my own life, I've told you before, uh, I was the most shy, introverted person in the world. I know, I know, it doesn't seem possible, but I was, okay, very, very insecure and shy, and it was a pastor who caught me as I was coming to church one day, just like you guys came this morning, and said in a panic, I could see it in his face, John, uh, so-and-so just called, and they have the flu, and they have all of their Sunday school material with them, and we're about five minutes till we start, I need you to teach the primary class. And I, I, I couldn't breathe. <laughs> you know, I just, like this, I mean, it was just like, 
immediate. I was as much of a panic as he was. To teach, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and uh, so he said, I'll tell you what we do. Since they don't have any material for you, uh, I'll, I'll go down, I'll make a copy of uh, one of these coloring pages from something else. And uh, just go in there and, you know, just tell them a story or something. You know, like that. And then he walked away. <laughs> and he came back. I don't know if I breathed in between that time. Mm -hmm. And he handed me those, you know, 20 sheets of this. It turned out it was David. Uh, a picture of what David, you know, with his sling. And uh, and he said, the class is right over there. And, and if you don't get in there soon, they'll have a wallpaper tore off. <laughs> and so, uh, <laughs> so I, I went over there. My knees were knocking so loud, it sounded like someone was playing a drum. I mean, it was terrible. Um, and I went into that class, and I thought, i got to do something. These little kids were looking at me, and I told the story of the picture, and I acted it out. And the kids got quiet, and their eyes were big and round. And then afterwards, we colored the page, and I would say, okay, they didn't know I was colorblind. I said, okay, what color do we color the hair? And uh, someone yelled out. I said, well, someone hand me that color crayon, and it worked pretty good for a while. And then so finally, someone would get your own color crayon. You know, those kids, eh? <laughs> get, get your own color crayon. And uh, she was a little older, so I said, Sarah, her name was Sarah. I said, Sarah, I said, I couldn't tell this to everybody, but I think I can tell it to you. I'm colorblind. And I was waiting for her to go, oh, I am so sorry. <laughs> you, know, I was, you know, okay, go ahead and give it to me. I've heard it before, you know, I'm so sorry. And she picked up a color crayon, stared me right in the face, flipped it with her fingers like this and said, can you read? And I, <laughs> I did not know that what was written on the side of the crayon paper was a color. <laughs> I mean, an orange and, and uh a uh, banana, and uh, all these different names that are on there, apricot. I, I thought, who in the world would ever name a color that? Because I never associate those things with color. <laughs> but uh, you could have seen her face. She rolled it just like that, and she said, you can read, can't you? But uh, that day was a, a big day in my life, because when I walked out, I remember hearing the kids say, can he come back next week? And that's all I needed. To, to know that you can be effective even if you feel totally incompetent. Mm -hmm. To notice and realize that you can be effective in communicating the greatest message ever told <coughs> is so fulfilling. And so when we get down to church membership, one of the things that we have to realize is that God did this wonderful thing, and that is pastors and teachers. All right? Pastors and teachers. Those are the two uh, ministries that are the most active in a local church today, teachers and pastors. Evangelists, there's some people that just have a gift of doing that. And I've been in a lot of different churches, and I've identified those people that have that gift of evangelism. They never meet a stranger. They're a totally, totally inhibited, uninhibited, excuse me, to, to tell people about Jesus Christ. I have seen some of the people they've talked to wrinkle their face, stick their nose up, show that defiant pride and rebellion in their face, and those people didn't even see it. I mean, they just, they just marched right on through. I thought, if I saw that, I'd say, okay, okay, you don't want to, don't rob them, I don't want to fight, you know, like this. But they just kept right on going. It's just a gift that they have. But teaching and, and being a pastor, this is, these are the two main gifts that are left in the church today. To communicate God's word. And uh, Mary Lane, probably one of the ones here that's been teaching for the longest. And I'm sure that that's one of the big things that you regret uh, being able to see in the eyes of those kids that they understand what you're telling them and how fulfilling that is. So, this is how God gave us to the church, gave us these people for us to minister. Now, what were these ministers to do according to verse 12? There's three things there, right? Anybody get that? Edifying the body of Christ. Okay. Work ministry. Work of the ministry, yep. Perfect the saints. Perfect the, the saints. Okay, so 
perfect. <laughs> uh, a lot of times in that, uh, we, we're using this Bible here because it's the easiest to get everybody on the same page with us. It's a uh, King James, used to be called authorized. And the King James authorized version use words that we don't use the same way. So sometimes we'll read the word like conversation in the Bible and we think it's about talking. But in the Bible, when it speaks the word conversation, it's about how we live. Okay. And here's another one. Perfect. If, uh, John, if you were helping me at house, at the house, and uh, you asked me the question, how did that, how did, how's that? After I asked you to do something for me, and you said, how's that? What's one of the answers I'd give to you? Because. Perfect. What? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's right. Yeah. Uh, perfect. Well, that doesn't mean that he did it perfect. It is that it was exactly what I wanted. All right. It's exactly what I wanted. So when it talks about perfect the saints, is to bring the saints to exactly what God wants them to be. And it's reemphasized in the next answer, which we'll get to in a minute. But perfecting the saints is not making us perfect. Perfecting the saints is getting us to where God wants us. So one of the things that ministers are supposed to do is get us where we want to. I doubt that Mary Lane, one of those kids that she taught all those lives to be perfect, that was an unrealistic expectation for a kid, right, to be perfect. Anybody that's a parent knows that, even when they're 40. It's hard to get them to be perfect. Amen. But but the idea is, is moving towards the goal for Christ to get where you, God wants them. Perfecting the saints. The work of the ministry is multifaceted. There's so many different things to do. But the bo bottom line uh, of those three is edifying. You know what edifying is? Building up, encouraging. All right. Uh, you've all probably all done this. How many of you have or have had pets? Okay, so you'll know this, all right? So if my, uh, I have uh, uh, Corky or whatever his name is, okay, is my dog, and he comes up and I go, Corky, you're the best dog I've ever had, and I want to know, I want you to know how much I love you. What's the demeanor of that dog at that time? <laughs> Ears are back up against the side of the head, tail between the legs, all right? The contrawise of that, I could say, Corky, you're the worthless mutt. I'll tell you what, you're just a, Worst thing I've ever seen. And that tail's going like this, and I'm just wanting to lift all over me. So edifying is the latter. Edifying has to do with tone and body language and words, where you build someone up. If, if what the only time that you can congratulate someone is when they have done it perfect, then you're not going to be able to do that. But one of the things that we have in our home, and I didn't make this up, I'd like to take credit for it, that's any progress towards the goal is positive. Encourage people, build them up, edify them, build them up. Now, not just in, oh, that's the most beautiful dress I ever saw, or, oh, that's a handsome uh, suit that you have, but we're to edify them in the Word, all right? Edify them in the Word. Uh, the other day, a pastor here in town sent me a text, and it was a complimentary uh, text. And um, I sent back to him uh, Proverbs, uh, iron sharpens iron. Um, and he understood exactly what that meant, that each of us were doing what God wanted us to do. I was acknowledging that he was standing in Christ's stead and <coughs> encouraged me. And I was wanting to let him know that that was in obedience to the word of God. And together we were ever able to edify or build one another up or compliment to encourage one another. So the, one of the things that ministers are supposed to do, back to the saints, work in the ministry, edify the body of Christ. Now, when you're teaching a younger class, it's a little hard to get all that done, right? I mean, how many of you have ever seen this right in the middle of your most important closing remark? You know, and then it's this, you know, and then it's this, and then it's this. You know, and you're thinking, i gotta come, I got to cut this short. <laughs> We're going to have a mess on our hands. And then finally, you cut it short, and you go, okay, yes, Johnny, what do you want? Uh, and they can't remember what they, the question was. I mean, you know, so when you're in those classes, you might not feel like you're doing a lot of edifying. Granted. But I, I look at my life, I'm sure that many of you that have been in church for a long time look at your life. I can still remember the teachers that I had. I don't remember one story they told me. 
but I remember every one of those teachers. And every one of them had a uniqueness about them. And what they did, in essence, when I left their class, they said, Johnny, God's going to use you someday. And you're a really good kid in Sunday school. And I thought, well, yeah, sure. Pull the wool over on their eyes. <laughs> you know, but they built me up. They encouraged me. And that's what God wants us to do. That's one of the good things about the church. What's the ultimate goal? of this type of teaching according to verse 13. There's a number of things that were listed. What is it? Someone give me one of them. Unity of faith. Unity of faith. Okay. Uh, one of the, the accomplisher goals of this is that it unifies and brings us together. What's another one? Knowledge. 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 We learn about God. Right. You know, one of the things that I find as a pastor in churches that I've gone to is that people are pretty ignorant about God. I mean, they have this self-concept of God, but they lack the biblical understanding of God. And so one of the uh, goals of teaching and preaching the Word is to uh, give people knowledge of the Son of God. And then here comes this word again. Perfect man. Okay? That doesn't mean sinless. That means moving towards what God wants us to do. You want me to do it like this, Dad? Perfect. Keep going. Okay, it's moving in that direction, perfect, perfect man. And then it's defined by that next statement. What's the last one? Measure up to Christ. All right. So he's the standard, and we know if we know what the standard is, then we know if we're moving this way or this way. And so that's the whole idea of the ultimate goal of this teaching according to verse 13. Why is the pursuit of this goal so important? According to verse 14. Anybody have any idea? He was not tossed about with every wind okay. of doctrine and craftiness. Okay. So one of them is not to live as children. That would be immature. A lot of Christians are immature in their faith. Do you know what immature kids do, don't you? They do things and they don't know that they did it wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You say, how could you be? How could you do that? Well, I didn't know. You, you've never said it, but I mean your brothers did. And uh, how do you know? <laughs> you know? But immature, you, immature people do funny things. You know, and you think, what are they? What were they thinking? All right. So God <clears throat> wants us to have pastors and teachers to teach us about Him, bring unity among us, move us in the direction of His standard, so that we're not immature. And uh, live as children. And then toss. Uh, Reed has talked about that toss to and fro. That's insecure. One day I believe this. The next day I believe this. The next day I believe this. The next day I believe this. Uh, if you think about the Christian life in sync with a human life, anytime our children cease to grow, we immediately say something is Wrong. wrong. Okay. So this is the whole idea. Is if someone is tossed to and fro, you say something is wrong because you're not learning. And that's the importance of Sunday school and a church. <clears throat> Sunday morning preaching, <clears throat> don't have the opportunity to teach as much as you do in a Sunday school class. Because there are a lot of folks that come, they don't even know where Genesis is in the Bible. They don't even know that it is in the Bible. And so Sunday morning, you know, you, you're a little bit more general in what you, the information you give. But the Sunday school brings the nuts and bolts, and, and it helps us to be established in our faith. And I, I'll give you an example of this. Uh, um, uh, Betty's not here today. She had a, a small surgery, and she's recovering. But Betty came to me. Well, it's been a year and a half ago, and really it was Twyla and Betty got together. Oh, boy, I'll tell you, put two ladies together. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but they got together, I think it was, and maybe Rita was involved in that, too. But they said, you know, in Wednesday night uh, Bible study, we, we're learning a lot, but we don't have a chance to ask any questions. And could we ever figure out a way to be able to ask some of our questions? And so uh, we all kind of put our heads together, and I said, well, what if we just said, Anybody that has questions, submit them to us, and then uh, we'll answer each one of those questions. And that's been almost, well, this November be two years ago. Hard to believe. And like, 
tomorrow, or no, the day of two today, it'll be two years. And over 135 questions have been submitted, and we've gone down one by one and answered those questions. Those are questions that people say, I don't want to be tossed to and fro. I want to know what God's Word says. One of the ones that I delighted in the most was someone not from our church, a teenager, happened to be a young boy, teenager sent in, and he wanted to know about premarital sex. And I thought, well, that was interesting. And so we went right through it in the Bible as as straightforward as we can. And in today's world, what I said sounded like stupidity. It was so different than what the world says. Okay. And afterwards, he says, you know what? I believed all those things. He sent me an email. I believed all those things. I knew all those things. I just didn't know where they were in the Bible. And he said, now I know when someone asks me, I can take them right to the Bible and show them what I've always believed, because that's what I've always been taught, but I've never been taught it that, you know, showing me where it is in the Bible. So the importance of church membership, one of the big importance of church membership is we come here to hear, and as we do that, we, we become less immature, or more mature, and we become less secure, uh, uh, insecure, meaning that we're tossed to and fro, and we, we'd be able to say, I know whom I have believed. And this has to do with our doctrinal beliefs, all right? So what does God seek to accomplish in our lives when we comply with his goal, according to verse 15? What does he bring to us? Anybody get it? You grow up, yeah. So biblical maturity. You grow up. That's, I mean, that's the goal. Amen. Nobody likes to see their kids walk down the aisle and get married, but at the same time, because that means you know you're going to be an empty nester. But at the same time, you you think it worked. <laughs> you know, it, it worked. I mean, uh, it's hard for you to imagine your 19 or 20 or 21 year old kids going to get married. It's like they don't even know how to put clothes in the washing machine yet. But uh, you know, but we were all that way. We just now we look back and we don't seem like we were that immature at the time that we got married. But that whole goal of all of this biblical stuff that we've just talked about is to get us to be more mature in Jesus Christ. When the church family seeks to reach God's goal, verse 16. What do they resemble? A body. A, body. a working body. Now, we have a, a wonderful thing here at First Baptist. We have young people and we have older people. A good mixture in between the two. Some of the younger people don't know what they're getting ready to experience in another 30 or 40 years, but we do. <laughs> okay, And that is that the body doesn't work as well later in life. And when it does, we cannot accomplish the things that we used to be able to accomplish so easily. If you can think of that picture in your mind, that's what the goal of church membership and what's supposed to happen in a church is that it creates a working body. A working body. You all know my uh, recent situation. Uh, John pushed me off the roof and I fell and broke my hip. And uh, uh, just check and see if you're awake. And uh, but uh, before that event, some of you will really live this with me. Before that event, I didn't even look at my feet when I stepped from the ladder to the roof, and I just walked right up to the top of the roof, never gave it another thought. Now, I can't make that step without looking where my feet are. Says that at some point, when the body breaks down, you can't accomplish what you could. And God says, if you want to keep the body, which is the church, a healthy, working body, then you need the church to have the Word of God taught and preached so that it all comes together and it's a mature body I, I like to think of my mom. Uh, many of you have sent her cards. She has them posted all over her wall. Mom's smile is radiant as always. And many of you remember that smile. She can light up a room. Her laughter is infectious. You get her giggling. And uh, you, there's no way not to giggle with her. But her mobility is suffering because her body is not working properly. And uh, the church, the purpose of the church, and what God gave the church these ministers for is to get the church working 
as a healthy body. All right. Now we're going to move into this. We'll just get started and, and uh, have to stop almost. But on page 23, we're talking about what's in the church. We, we know the founder of the church. We know why we're supposed to go to church. Now let's talk about the officer or the pastor of the church. The word pastor in the New Testament means overseer, kind of overseer. God's given us a pastor to train and nurture us in the Lord. And this great verse, page four, uh, 547 in your um, uh, Bibles, but Acts 20, 28, what is a, a pastor supposed to do? Feed the church. Feed the church of God. Now, I like to take a little pause here for a minute and say, many of us have this preconceived idea, kind of a uh, little house on the prairie mindset of what a pastor is supposed to do. And because of that, if that person doesn't perform that expectation, then we feel like we don't have a good pastor, or where was the pastor, or what did he, why did he do his job, pastor, okay? But if our concept of what a pastor is supposed to be and do is not biblical, then you'll have unrealized expectations if you have a, a biblical pastor. Does that make any sense, what I just said? Okay. So let's look at the Bible and say, what is a pastor, according to the Bible, what are they supposed to do? The first thing is they're supposed to feed the sheep or the church of God. According to this same verse, who made the pastor the overseer of the church? The church search committee. No. No. Holy Spirit. Okay. The, the, the Holy Spirit. Now, does he use people? Mary Lane was on the uh, uh, diaconate when uh, they approached me uh, long before the search committee was looking for me. And uh, uh, she said, we would like for you to come and, and uh, be our intern pastor. All right? And there's nothing wrong with any of that. But it's important to understand that if when your church finally comes to the place where they find somebody that they feel like God sent them, <coughs> that they realize that they get to make the choice of whether they want him or not, but they acknowledge who it was that sent them. Mm -hmm. All right? That it was, it was God. Uh, because uh, um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, was anybody here on the search committee? Okay. So I can say whatever I want. Nobody knows. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I, I believe they went through 30 some resumes in their search. And they could only find a clear testimony of salvation in one of them. Oh. No wonder. So it's very easy to get someone <clears throat> that you may think is good, but isn't one that was sent from God. All right. So uh, the important thing is to realize that God made the pastor the overseer of the church, and <clears throat> regardless of what a constitution would say, or regardless of what the expectation of the church is, God's purpose for a pastor is to oversee the work. Okay. Now, according to 1 Peter 5, 2, which is page 597, what four things characterize a pastor's correct oversight of the church? If I get those, we'll stop with these this morning. What's one of them? Feed the flock. Feed. What's this? Feed the flock. Feed the flock. Okay. All right. What's another one? Be an example. Be an example or an example. Yes. What's another one? Overseer. Overseer. Yep. What's another one? Not domineering. Not domineering. Okay, what's another one? Not for money. Not for money. Yeah, that's, a, that's another one. Okay. What's, is there anything else? Be of a ready mind. A Be ready mind. mind. Yep. <clears throat> yep. Yep. Very good. So, I, I put them down. We all use different words. There's no problem with that. <clears throat> one is uh, a pastor should not do what he does of necessity. Not because he's forced to. He's supposed to do it willingly. Willingly. Not for filthy lucre. Not for money. Of a ready mind. That means you, you have the task at hand and you want to do that and you're prepared for it. And as uh, Dave said, not, not as lords over the flock. All right? And then Dave also brought out uh, question number four, so we'll go to that. In the very next verse, 1 Peter 5, 3, how is a pastor supposed to lead the church? 
be an example. By being an example. So, so what happens in a church, we've all been in them, where you have this kind of adversarial relationship that starts to develop between the overseer, pastor, and the church body. And it can happen pretty quick. A lot of times it's because of unrealized expectations. And if we have a little house on the prairie mentality, we want them to marry us, bury us, and come to our house when we're sick. But you'll have a hard time finding those three things in the Bible. That's not what's in the Bible. And so breaking that mindset of what we have as expectations for a pastor, and many times what's on the, uh, you know, we ask, do you have a job description? And they show you the job description, and it has all these things that are not biblical on it. It's not that you don't want to do that. It's not that you wouldn't do that. But that's not the focus, all right? Uh, the focus, as we will see later, uh, is that God wants the pastor uh, to be a student of this book, a student of prayer, so that when he stands to teach or to preach, like the Israelites in the Old Testament, there is a glow upon the face of Moses that you know they've been with Jesus. That's, that's the biblical pastor is that you don't cumber him about with administration and you don't cumber him about with all the diaconate responsibilities, but you say, get in your study, get with God, get in the Word, so that Sunday when we come, we have more than three points in a poem. Give us something that you got from God. And that's one of the biggest things that's missing in the ministry today. And, and we have good clubs, but we don't have good churches. Because <laughs> good churches are not just a fellowship center. Good churches are making us complete in Christ, knowledgeable of who God is, and brings us into unity of faith. So, uh, it's interesting how far removed we get in some aspects of what God's Word asks or demands of us, <coughs> because our expectations have been somewhat um, blurred or or, um, or or misled, I guess I should say. So next week we'll pick it up right there uh, on the middle of page 24, talking more about pastors, and uh, then we'll get to the purpose of the church. And I think you'll find that exciting as we. Uh, and anytime you have a purpose, you know what that means. Everybody's going in the same direction. All right. So. Um, we hope that we can do that. But I hope that you're enjoying the class and enjoying the importance of starting my walk with Christ. And let's close this morning in a word of prayer. Father, we are indeed grateful for our great God, our Savior, His Word, and our understanding as the Holy Spirit gives us life. I pray, Father, that you continue to bless us and bless this class and help us, Lord, as we take our walk with you to take it in the right, right direction. Be at the service to follow. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless. Have a great day.